Hello PCamers, this is DW and I was going to give you a quick tutorial on the Gauss View and Gaussian software that we're going to be using this week and just wanted to give you a rundown on some of the menu options, how to build molecules and to show you some tips and tricks on how to make molecules. So here's the Gauss View interface that you see. Um, by default it seems a carbon, tetrahedral carbon is selected but let's say we wanted to make acetonitrile like you do in this week's lab down here is the molecule build window. This is the active fragment that we're going to be using. So we just click down there and we get a methyl group. <clears throat> For acetonitrile though, we need a, a, a nitrile group added onto this. So we come up here to the carbon and we see when we click the, the carbon group we get the periodic table. Carbon is selected and then we have all the different carbon atom types. You can put a single atom on there or you can have an SP hybridized carbon. There's really two forms of that. This is where there's a triple bond to one side. This would be like alene, that central carbon in alene, where it has a double bond in each direction, or CO2. Uh, here's an, an sp2 hybridized carbon, an sp2 with partial aromaticity, and then here's an sp3 carbon. So what we want for acetonitrile, that central carbon that's triple bonded to a nitrogen on the other end, is this form of carbon. And you see the active atom is in green. And whatever I click on in these hydrogens, that atom is going to become that hydrogen. So if I click right here, it turns that atom into that sp carbon. So that's the first piece of acetonitrile. Then we need to put the nitrogen on. We come in here and get this nitrogen with triple bond, and we add it right there, and we've made acetonitrile. So it really can't be any easier than that. <coughs> now this is a very short bond, that's a very long bond. If you wanted to go in and modify those bond lengths, I don't know why you would, but let's say you did. Let's say you wanted to come in. This little button up here is how you modify a bond. This would be how you modify a bond angles and then dihedral angles. So let's click that tool. You select two atoms and then this dialog pops up that tells you what that bond length is. And then if you wanted to modify it, you could stretch that slider out you can make it shorter. So this is a way to change the structure that you're building. And one reason you might want to do this, like in the iodine atom, is you might want to make it close to the experimental value because Gaussian is going to find the minimum, but it may take a long time if you start with a poor guess. So if you give it a molecule that's pretty well optimized, then it's going to be a very fast optimization calculation. So if you don't want it to calculate forever, start with a, a better initial guess and the calculation will go quickly. <clears throat> but for small molecules it really there's really not that much need to worry about the initial guess. Now if we wanted to optimize this structure we come up to calculate Gaussian calculation setup. The hotkey is control G and we have lots of options here. The first tab is job type and these are the different job types that Gaussian can do. The ones that we're going to worry about the most in this course are optimization and frequency. And in fact, you can combine them into a combination job, opt plus freak. And so we're going to do that one because it will calculate the optimized geometry and go right into a frequency calculation. <coughs> so we have these other options. We're going to optimize to a minimum. The calculate force constants, you don't need to worry about that for now. This says default on compute Raman. I want to go ahead and say yes. So I want to always compute my Raman uh, intensities. The, the frequencies of the Raman transitions are going to be the same as the vibrational frequencies. But this is, at your, it's asking you, do you want me to calculate the intensities, the scattering intensities for the Raman transitions? And so go ahead and put yes on that. And so that's, that's all you need for the job type. Then you go to method. This is where you set your level of theory and basis set. So we want to calculate the ground state of the molecule. Here's HF, or Hartree fock and you see that when we select that, this the HF up here is in this command line. And so we can come down here and do DFT for density functional theory. And the default method is B3LYP. You have these other options, but this is the one we're interested in. And then we get to the basis set. So this top row is the method, or level of theory. Um, and that's how, you know, if it's an ab initio or density functional theory, that's how we're uh, c correcting for the lack of electron correlation. 
You also have other methods like semi-empirical, molecular mechanics, uh, but we're going to be doing DFT. And then you have the basis sets. Now for the largest molecule, the iodine, we're going to use this Los Alamos National Laboratory basis set, Atlantal 2 dz because it covers the whole periodic table. But for the other molecules, we're just going to do 6-31G, sort of that industry standard basis set, and we're going to put D orbitals on all the heavy atoms, everything but hydrogen. So 6-31G with the D in this first block. And so you can see how it's built our command line up here. This is the the uh, method and this is the basis set. Now this molecule is zero charge, so that's correct, and a singlet. Now for oxygen, O2, it's zero charge but it's a triplet. So oxygen has an unpaired electron on each atom if you want to think of it that way. We'll learn more about that when we get to molecular orbital theory. But that's the one molecule that people almost always mess up when they're first learning Gaussian is they calculate oxygen as a singlet when ground state oxygen is a triplet. There is a singlet oxygen but it's not the ground state. Also when you calculate the cyanide ion it's CN minus 1 so you're gonna have to change this charge to a minus 1 and then pick singlet because the extra electron makes that an even electron molecule and then you uh, can have a singlet state. We don't need any additional keywords. Uh, let's keep going down through the tabs. So title tab, you can put any of these, you know, anything you want here. I'm gonna, if I was doing this lab, I'd type in lab five uh, in my username. So something that would designate it as my calculation. So if there was ever any confusion about which laptop I used and what my calculation was, I could find it very easily. I'll also put my username in the file name as well so I can find my files. Okay, then link zero. This is, um, I guess, hard to explain. This is where we uh, store intermediate values in this thing called a checkpoint file. That's useful if we're going to then use uh, our output to compute surfaces like molecular orbitals or the total electron density or maybe an electrostatic potential you need to know what your checkpoint file name is. And this Gauss, Gauss View, latest Gauss View package allows this automatic option to just create a checkpoint file that has the parent file name. So we don't have to change anything on this tab. This general tab, I like to uncheck this right connectivity. It's just a personal preference. It just makes the input file a little cleaner. And I think that's everything. The default values for all of these other things are, should be fine. Uh, the only one, one thing that does crop up, sometimes you see up here SCRF or some other kinds of, of values, and that means it's, it's doing a solvation calculation. So a lot of times you have to come back to the solvation tab and select none so that it gets rid of this solvation calculation. There's some peculiarities with Gauss View that when it loads an optimization it assumes you want to do a solvation calculation that follows up with that and that's a it's a bad assumption so just be aware of that sometimes you need to come to the solvation tab and click none. I think that's it so we're ready to go with submit. So we hit submit it asks us to give that a, that a, a file name and so I'm going to type in Acetonitrile, and maybe um, F-opt, because it's a frequency and an optimization, and my um, login information. So this shows that it's my calculation. It's a frequency optimization of acetonitrile, and dot GJF. So D GJF stands for Gaussian job file. And then it asks, do you want to submit that file to Gaussian? I say yes. So then the Gaussian window pops up. And we can see that it's calculating the orbital energies. It's combining those into the energy for a molecule. It's comparing those energies with different steps to see if the gradient is zero, if the energy is at a minimum, if the next step of geometry changes to the molecule are going to be small or not. And once it satisfies those four criterion, then it's going to be happy that it's at a minimum energy. And then it goes into the frequency calculation, where it calculates the, the second derivative of that energy uh, as, the, 
as a function of the vibrational motions, and that gives you the vibrational frequencies. Once it has the vibrational frequencies, it calculates some thermochemistry data. So you can see the pretty quick calculation. We have two options for opening a file. The log file is what you want. The checkpoint file would be useful for surfaces, but at this point we're just going to bring up the molecule and look at the vibrations. So then we have our molecule here, and if we showed the Cartesian coordinates like I did in class, you can see the z-axis is the symmetry axis. The origin is the center of mass of the molecule. And so everything looks good. I'm going to shrink this down, and we can look at the vibrational frequencies for this molecule. So since we've loaded in an, an optimized log file uh, of, with the frequency calculation, under results we see vibrations. So we can select that. And then these are all of the vibrations for the molecule. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six atoms. Six times three is 18. And so that's the total degrees of freedom is 18. You subtract three translations and three rotations because it's a nonlinear molecule. We have 12 vibrations left over. And so here are all 12 vibrational modes. We have the lowest frequency vibrations here. And you can see that that's the bending of the molecule. Wait, what's wrong? Well, I don't know what happened. Let's try that again. Vibrations. Oh, I hit close instead of uh, start animation. Okay, so we have the, the lowest frequency vibrations, and you can see those are the bending modes. Can you see that the motion is along the x-axis in this case? You know, we had those arrow diagrams that we were showing in class, but here we can show the dipole derivative unit vector and that's going to show you the change in the dipole moment and it's along the x-axis. And so we know then that x-polarized light would excite that mode. Isn't that great? We can look at the other one and it's probably going to be doubly degenerate. They have the same frequency so that means they have the same energy spacing and this one's probably going to be along the y-axis and it is. So that's a doubly degenerate vibration in that character table that's going to be on an E row and then let's look at this one this is the CC stretch and the dipole derivative is along the Z axis because it's along the axis of the molecule here's another doubly degenerate row it's probably the rocking of the CH3 group and so you see how it's rocking and it's along the Y axis and now it's rocking along the X axis and then this one is a symmetric one. It's by itself. It's probably the symmetric bend. So all of those angles, the HCH angles, are all decreasing and increasing at the same time. So that's the symmetric bend. Okay, this is the asymmetric stretch. No, that's still a bending mode, sorry. Okay, and here's another angle bending mode. And so here is the, the nitrile. Now that's kind of a little ridiculous so that you can change the displacement amplitude to where it's a little more realistic. <coughs> so that's a little bit more realistic. Now this, this would be actually a very higher, much higher frequency. So you can change the frequency. And then we get into the CH stretch. So that's the symmetric stretch. And that would be even higher frequency. And then this would be the asymmetric stretch. So you can see the changes along the y-axis and along the x-axis. And then the symmetric stretches along the z-axis. So those are the vibrational modes in acetonitrile. Now for, for lab, you'll be able to calculate these and then you, for the next lab, you'll be actually able to generate this simulated spectrum using your Excel file. So you will calculate these vibrational modes and then you'll use your spreadsheet spectral simulator to generate these simulated spectra. 
This is kind of a nice interface that Gauss View has. You can come in here and you can select the frequency and you can see the vibrations. So that's a pretty cool tool. So every one of these peaks in the molecule is a different motion. And so when we're seeing this complicated spectrum now, you can see what's going on with the molecule using Gaussian. Let's look at some of the other options. Let's turn off the animation and close this. What are some of the other calculation options? Well, you can come up here and for large molecules, really under method, you have molecular mechanics. And I like the universal force field. Uh, other, other people may prefer the amber um, force field. Then there's semi-empirical. Um, I like PM3, but some people like AM1. So really it's just personal preference. You look in the literature, and if you're trying to repeat other people's calculations, you can use the method that they used. Okay. So I think that's a, a nice start to understanding Gaussian and how to set up these calculations. And I think there's a, there's a video already on Blackboard on how to decipher the output file. So I just wanted to give you a little bit of the tutorial on, on Gaussian. Oh, let's look at also, let's look at some more complicated molecules. So let's, let's do ethane. So let's try to, try to make eclipsed and, and uh, staggered ethane. Okay. So we're going to choose this kind of carbon, and there we have now staggered ethane, but let's say I wanted to make an eclipsed ethane. So I need to change that dihedral angle. So I don't want the, the hydrogens to be, uh, to be staggered, I want them to be eclipsed. So I need to rotate one methyl group with respect to the other. So that's what this tool here is, the dihedral angle tool. I select four atoms and I get this little tool here where I can rotate those dihedrals. Now there's, I can rotate, this is what you want. You want the methyl groups to rotate with, with respect to each other. But sometimes it does this, where it's just moving that one atom. See, and that's not what you want. Because see, if I make that zero, I can even type in zero, and it's just rotated the atom, Look what's happened to the molecule. See, this end is kind of messed up. It's not an eclipsed form. So I didn't want that. Actually, I want to rotate the group. And so now I've got to undo all of this and start over. So I'm going to select those four atoms. And I want the groups to rotate. <clears throat> and so now I can set this to zero. And then I'll have a perfectly eclipsed ethane molecule. Now, it might not be perfect. So sometimes you want to adjust the symmetry. And up here somewhere is a symmetry tool. Let me find it. Just hover over the buttons until you find the one you're looking for. Here it is. It says symmetrize. So I clicked that and it said D3H down here. So it said it's close to D3H, so it made it a perfectly D3H molecule. So if that's the one I want, then now I'm ready to go and do a geometry optimization, and it should st get stuck in that D3H form. Okay. So that's uh, using that dihedral tool is very helpful, especially if you have functional groups and you want to make sure that they're aligned with the aromatic ring or, or you know, sticking off a molecule, if you want to make the, the dihedral angles do what you want them to do, you need to use that dihedral angle mo uh, editing tool. I think that's enough for now. So good luck with this week's lab. Thanks.